Um, so my name is Robert Cole. Um, I'm the medical director of advanced heart failure at Piedmont um, in Atlanta, across town from Dr. Howard. Uh, and it's a, my pleasure to, to present our uh, center experience with Barostem. We have about 47 implants so far. Um, if you had asked me three years ago if I'd be discussing our, our center's uh, experience with Barostem, I would have said probably not, because like many of you in this room, I was a skeptic. Um, hopefully, as you'll see, and, and sort of what turned me is, you know, seeing really is believing, and seeing some of these patients uh, really improve their quality of life tremendously, uh, and in many cases actually remodeling. I think once you see it, uh, yeah, you, you'll adopt it as well. Um, I do want to highlight, let's see here, if this will go. There we go. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about quality of life. Um, I think we do a great job with GDMT, which clearly improves mortality, heart failure hospitalizations, and things. But if you ask the patients uh, if they could choose quality of life over quantity, um, many of them would choose quality of life. I think we lose sight of that. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion, obviously, about the long-term BHF data. I will tell you the 47 patients that we've implanted, we had no mortality data for. We did it to improve their quality of life. And I think um, if you view it as a quality of life improvement, improvement um, many of your patients will, will buy into that. Um, obviously, hopeful for clinical improvements and outcomes. And I'll show you some of the uh, outcomes of our first 30 implants uh, for which we have six month follow up data. Um, this was shown uh, already in our first talk, our fantastic talk. Um, GDMT, obviously great for mortality, heart failure hospitalizations, all of our fabulous composite endpoints in our clinical trials. Um, that being said, do very little for exercise tolerance. And as we know, patients, um, they want to feel better. I've, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but class three heart failure sucks. Could you imagine if you had to get up and walk out the room and you were short of breath by the time you got to the door? Um, I think we take that for, for granted. You know, minimal activity leads to shortness of breath. Um, patients want to feel better. As we alluded to, CRT can do that if you're in that small population of patients who has a left bundle, especially if it's greater than 150, and if you're a candidate for that, great. Um, but short of that, we really don't have a lot of therapies for improving quality of life. And ironically, most of the ones that have shown improvements in quality of life are devices, not the medications, as you can see here. Uh, CRT, of course, indicated in that small population of patients. Um, CCM um, also indicated for EF25 to 45. And then you can see Barostem here. Um, so I just reiterate, when you're thinking about your patients, yes, mortality is important. Yes, heart failure hospitalizations are important, but what's important to the patient oftentimes is quality of life, and that's where Barostem can really uh, impact that. So a little bit about our experience, which is what I'm here to talk about today. Um, if you're not familiar with Piedmont, um, we're a large healthcare system in Atlanta and throughout Georgia. We have uh, 19 hospitals total. Um, we have five cardiologists at our main hub. You can see our, uh, we are an advanced therapy center um, we do a lot of transplants, a lot of LVADs, a uh, fair amount of cardiomems, and as I alluded to, we have about 47 uh, implants, 30 of, who have, um, of whom have six-month follow-up data, at least some very basics. Um, and we, we launched our program about two years ago. So, uh, you know, just for curiosity, I um, decided to look at our patients, look at our data, who are we implanting, what happens to them, um, because anecdotally, the patients that I referred did really well. And I wasn't sure if that was true across all the patients uh, of the other uh, cardiologists. So we looked at this, uh, again, our first 30 implants, and you can see the general demographic of the patients, sort of typical uh, late 60s, uh, majority ischemic, interestingly. Um, I think this is a really interesting category, CRT non-responders. Uh, over a quarter of them were non-responders, and a few had cardiomems as well. Um, ejection fractions, 25%, mildly dilated, um, mildly reduced stroke volume, and you can see the NT-pro BMPs here. Um, the baseline urocardiac decision class, of course, 
indicated for class three or class two with recent class three. Um, we had, have used some off-label um, and some more advanced patients, uh, which we can talk about another time, but we have had a few patients that are a little bit sicker. Um, I was curious what kind of medications these patients were on um, because we have a fair amount recently uh, that are beta blocker intolerant that, that is sort of a, a population I think can really benefit from this. Um, but if you look, about half of the patients were on at least 50% or greater beta blocker target doses. Um, all patients were on an ACE Arb and Arnie, um, about 40% on at least 50% or greater. And then you can see MRA use and SGLT2 inhibitors Pretty modest diuretic use in this population. Uh, the average equivalent of about 40 of Lasix. Uh, so what happened to our 30 patients? Well, um, as with any advanced heart failure program, some patients died um, prior to one year follow-up. The three patients, interestingly, that died, you can see um, really primarily died from non-heart failure, although you could argue that the third one here may be. But uh, this first patient had underlying interstitial lung disease and actually uh, died of hypoxemic respiratory failure related to that. Um, interestingly, the, the patient's EF at six months had increased by about 5% for what it's worth. Um, this patient, uh, our second one that passed, uh, was really tragic, died of septic shock. Um, he was what I would consider a major responder to the therapy. Uh, his EF uh, improved by 15% at the six month mark. Uh, unfortunately, uh, went on to die of infection. And then our last one was an elderly gentleman who had a very poor quality of life and a lot of comorbid conditions, as with many of our patients. And as a bit of a Hail Mary, we tried to, to use it in him. Unfortunately, he came in with urinary retention, unrelated uh, kidney injury, and, and did not want to go on dialysis and chose hospice. So that was an unfortunate, very short uh, baristem uh, duration. Um, we have had a few patients go on to actually need advanced therapies. Um, two in particular went on to transplant. Um, there's nothing like a 2 a.m. phone call. What do we do with the baristem for this patient that's going to get a transplant? Do we turn it off? Do we take it out? Do we? Um, thankfully, um, we figured it out. But uh, we did have two patients that went on to get a heart transplant. As you can see, though, it was not an immediate um, transplant. In fact, it was about a year before those patients went on to need it. I think one of my biggest fears was what if we put this in an advanced patient uh, and they deteriorate rapidly and nobody wants to look like a fool, right? Um, similar to MitraClip, advanced patients, who's too sick, who's not too sick. Um, so the patients that ended up getting transplant made it about a year with their baristem prior to, to needing transplant. And then one patient actually very recently underwent LVAD uh, after about 520 days of follow-up after his baristem. So uh, the, the patients that did go on to need advanced therapies during that first period, uh, again, it was not an immediate effect so far. It was a, uh, a good year to two years. Um, so just looking at some of the, just a few clinical outcomes from our first 30, um, what about change in New York Heart Association class? Um, this is not the prettiest graph, <laughs> uh, apologies, but um, this is sort of a baseline, and if it's down below here, it means patients got worse. If it is above, it means they got better. I recognize that it should be minus, not plus New York Heart Association. Um, I think you can tell by the graphic, um, the majority of patients got better. Uh, five of the patients of these first 30 improved by at least two classes, 14 by one. We did have nine that had no, no difference. Again, like any therapy, not everybody is gonna to respond to this. Um, we did have one patient that in the first six months got worse. Obviously, we had some others that after six months got worse. Three patients that went on to get transplant and LVAD. But at least in the first six months, only one. Uh, and then one patient was the unfortunate gentleman who died on day 16, so we don't have data for that. So overall, about two-thirds of patients had an improvement um, in this first 30 patient cohort, uh, which was very reassuring to me because I, I was seeing my five or six that were doing well. The question is, what were the other patients doing? Um, for about, we only had echo data at six months follow-up on 21 of the 30. Um, you can see the change in ejection fraction uh, in these patients. 
uh, of the 21 that we do have data on. Uh, you can see um, a couple of patients really had a, a major response, uh, 15, 20 percent changes in EF. Uh, overall, a little over half of patients had an improvement in their ejection fraction, which um, is obviously an interesting uh, hypothesis generating uh, point, but um, there were plenty of patients who had no change, uh, certainly eight of them, and actually a couple that uh, at six months had a deterioration in their EF. So again, as with everything, uh, there are non-responders, but I think it's pretty impressive to see half of these patients, again, recognizing that these are patients that are already on their maximally tolerated GDMT. So it's not like these patients are uh, getting a varicim and GDMT titration simultaneously, although there are some patients that we do that with. Uh, and then lastly, something that we've really uh, been interested in, because the patients who seem to get the most symptomatic benefit uh, seem to have uh, really impressive changes in their diastology, which makes sense, certainly changes in left atrial pressure. Um, so we kind of wanted to look at this as well, change in diastolic dysfunction over the course of that six months by echo. Uh, and you can see, uh, again, about half of the patients had improvements uh, in their diastolic uh, function. Uh, eight improved by at least two grades. So those patients were class three down to class one, or excuse me, grade three down to grade one. Um, several that improved uh, one grade and then uh, others that did not. Um, so I think summarizing that data, and I'm about out of time, um, I think clearly in the first 30 patients that we've seen have seen some pretty impressive improvements. Obviously not everybody responds. Um, I want to just quickly highlight, I won't spend a lot of time on this, I said seeing is believing. I, I was not a, a believer until I saw these two patients. Uh, this first one was our second implant, a gentleman that really uh, reduced EF 15 to 20 percent. Uh, had an ICD and a cardiomems and was, was short of breath and really not tolerating a lot of GDMT, as you can see here, pretty minimal. Um, and this patient, again, one of our first implants, um, really had a remarkable improvement. Um, class one symptoms, essentially asymptomatic, exercising, working out, ejection fraction improved, you know, pro-BMP lower, and so forth. So this was sort of what, it, it definitely caught my attention. Um, Two cases later really just kind of blew my mind. And, it, and I, I don't want to overemphasize, again, there are plenty of patients, as with every therapy, that don't respond. But I think, as you can see, these cases, uh, all it takes is one or two for you to realize that there is a potential benefit. This patient was one of the most frustrating patients I think I've had. Um, really advanced symptoms despite extremely low BMP, uh, normal ventricular size, grade two dysfunction. Uh, on modest GDMT, uh, and this guy went on to have really a tremendous benefit. Uh, ejection fraction up, um, can't get much lower in the pro-BMP, but anyway, so seeing those two cases as our second and fourth case uh, really was eye-opening for me and my colleagues to the point where we really have uh, a treatment algorithm built in now that if there is a patient with an EF less than 35 on maximally tolerated GDMT and they are complaining, um, that is a patient that should be considered. Um, and if there are no advanced risk factors, you know, not anything concerning, we refer those patients for barostem. Um, in cases where the EF is severely reduced or there are some high risk features of the patient, very dilated, for example, we typically put them through CPSTs and right heart caths and use that as a fork in the road. If they're clearly sick enough, we go to transplant VAT evaluation. If there's reasonable peak VO2s and VEVCO2 slopes and reasonable hemodynamics, then we go to the Barrison path. And as you can see, in three cases a year later, we ended up getting the transplant VAD. But uh, I think a lot of the patients that we implant are generated through this. So if you're at an advanced therapy center, um, when you're assessing those patients for risk stratification, if they fall out of that transplant VAD category, Barrison, I think, is an excellent option for them. Um, because we're out of time and we have one more fabulous speaker left, um, I'll just leave you with the conclusions. Class three heart failure sucks. I give my kids a hard time for using that word all the time, so I apologize. Um, but quality of life is important to patients. Seeing is believing. You have to have some experience to see it. Um, and again, if you're seeing advanced patients and they're on the fence, get some objective data and 
find that fork in the road towards transplant versus baristem. Um, with that, I will stop. <laughs>